What's up guys? Welcome to another episode of Frozen Electronics. This time it's actually an episode and it's actually about something fairly interesting. Um, about an hour ago, or a little over an hour ago, I was going through all my boards, all the stuff on my bench here because it's such a mess, and I saw a board that um, came with my FPGA kit that's actually quite an interesting little chip, and it's basically just a breakout board for this chip. Uh, the chip, it's a PCF8591 by NXP. Now this chip is really interesting because it's not only an ADC, analog to digital converter, it's also a DAC or digital to analog converter, so you can go both ways. It's got uh, three analog inputs for the ADC, which isn't that many compared to like the built-in ADC on an Atmega, but uh, for this little chip it's fine. And then there's um, one analog output for the DAC. What makes this chip useful for beginners is the fact that it is an I2C protocol, um, it uses the I2C protocol for all its communication. Now, for those of you that don't know, I2C or I squared C is, um, oh, what does it stand for? Uh, Inter Integrated Circuit uh, Protocol. So it's a very simple two wire interface, which means it only needs two wires, those wires being. Uh, they're usually marked as SCL and SDA, which stands for Serial Clock and Serial Data. So you only need two wires to communicate, which is great. Uh, it makes it very easy. However, the difficulty comes in sometimes setting it up in software, uh, especially with Atmegas. I've always found that SPI, which can take three, four, and sometimes five wires, depending on how many devices are on your bus, uh, it can take quite a few more wires, usually three though. Uh, Mosi, Miso, and uh, Serial Clock. That can actually be easier to set up in software. Yes, it takes up an extra I.O. pin, um, but especially in AVC, um, AVR GCC, and with Atmel Studio, I can get an SPI bus up and running in minutes. Um, it takes me no time, and I used to struggle with the I2C bus, but that's because I just wasn't wrapping my head around it. I learned SPI first. Um, just because of what I was work, the projects I was working on as I was learning, and I always found SPI really easy. You set up the registers for the speed of your clock, um, and a couple other things, and then all you do is you put data in the register and it sends it. I mean, it's as simple as that, basically. And then you just put a little while loop to wait until it's done sending, and I was sending stuff with SPI in, you know, five minutes. Uh, well, not quite that fast, but I remember the first time I tried to interface to something with SPI, I read like two or three quick little tutorials online, and I actually had a working bus inside of an hour. So for a beginner whose C was pretty rusty at the time, pretty good. Anyway, my point being, this chip uses I2C, um, and I, had, so I was a little bit rusty, so I basically just read the data sheet for the chip I'm using. Um, I'm gonna have to take you freehand because I'm still having the problem where I can't edit things. Um, actually, I don't necessarily have to take you freehand at this point. First, I'll just take a look at what's going on down here. Hopefully you guys can see this okay. So this is my AVR Dragon I have here. This is an Atmega 324A. Pretty bog standard chip. Slightly different from your standard uh, Atmega 32. It's just got a couple more features and it's just like a new revision basically the 324a not a bad chip over here sort of floating in the wind is the um, PCF 8591 now it is hooked up to my bus pirate but the, the bus pirate is just there to provide power basically because I ran out of female to female cables um, so I just had to hook that up and also because I was fooling around with it with the bus pirate beforehand just testing it and so it was already hooked up to the power line so then I just decided to run the two SCL and SDA lines over to here now, as I've explained before, the AVR Dragon can be used like this, sort of in prototyping mode, where all the pins are broken out right beside it there. So you, I connected up the JTAG interface, I connected up power, and then the two lines, and that's all you need. It just sits right in the programmer. So for basic things like this, it makes it very easy. Anyway, so my goal was to make a DDS, or Direct Digital Synthesis. Now, this is how modern function generators work. Um, it's a little bit more complex than what I'm about to do and show you guys, but basically it's a DAC, usually a very powerful good DAC, much better than this one, and the controller chip or FPGA or whatever 
feeds it the values that represent a sine wave or a square wave or a triangle wave at an extremely high speed and the DAC just spits out whatever levels you tell it to spit out. So you can get very nice smooth sine waves. It's very easy to change frequency because you just change how far um, the steps are in between each piece of data you send it. So the bigger the steps in between, like the further apart each step is, the higher frequency you're gonna be. And then the more steps you put in in between, the lower your frequency is gonna be. If you wanna learn more about DDS, I highly recommend reading about it. It's, uh, it can be a complex subject, but basic DDS is quite easy to implement. And that's what we've done today. So now I'm gonna aim you up again, and we're going to look, um, first of all, we're gonna look over at the oscilloscope. If I can see what the camera is pointing at, that would definitely help. So you can see that I have a triangle wave there. That's being output right now by that chip. The AVR is just sitting there screaming away, um, sending the data over and over and over again for this triangle wave. Uh, yes, this is basically all I can do so far, but it only took me an hour to write this code and get everything set up, which is pretty good for an hour's worth of work, and I was just sort of doing it as an experiment, and this actually turned out a little bit better than I thought. So as you can see, there is a triangle wave, um, this is at one volt per division, so it's about uh, one, just over two volts high. Yeah, you can see a little bit better like that. Um, it's a little bit messy, I mean there's no filtering whatsoever, this is the direct output from the DAC. Um, and yeah, it's coming out at about just over 46 hertz. So yes, it's so slow that it's pretty much completely unusable for anything practical, but um, just as an example, and just for learning, it's actually quite uh, good. I was actually very happy with it. I just dropped my screwdriver, and I hate when I drop things, and they just sort of disappear into oblivion. I think I might have dropped it into my fan, and if I did, it's going to be stuck to the magnet in there. Anyway, I guess I'll figure that out later. So, that is what we're outputting. Now, I'm just going to go take a quick look at the code. I'm sorry, once again, for doing the handheld crap. I know, I don't like it either. So, here's my code. There's all the commenting. Uh, and as you can see, oops, see, this is why I hate the handheld stuff. As you can see, it's not much code. That's the whole thing right there. Very, very simple. On our other, my other screen here, this is the data sheet for this particular chip and um, I was looking at the pinout to get everything set up. The SCL and SDA are down here in the corner, pins 22 and 23. And then the four above it are JTAG, which I use to program uh, currently. So all those pins are all in one little spot there. Then I have an LED connected to pin A7, uh, which is just an error LED. So if the I squared C, um, response code doesn't equal what it's supposed to, the LED will blink five times and then the program will sit for a second and a half and then try again. So if you actually look, they actually have a whole section in the data sheet about the two-wire serial interface and if you don't know anything about it and this is your first time, I highly recommend you just sit, you don't even have to read the whole thing, just read these first couple of pages about the electrical interconnection and how everything works, the data transfer, start and stop conditions, etc. I was lucky enough to have a copy of, I don't know if I've showed this on the blog before, but I'm lucky enough to have a copy of this book, Mastering the I Squared C Bus by Vincent Hempe, uh, who is Free Electron on the EEV blog forum. Great, amazing book. Um, the reason I use the I squared C bus so much now is because I've read this and it really does help you master it. The funny thing is I understand it at a theoretical level because of this book extremely well, but it's implementing that um, with all sorts of different processors in different languages that's very difficult. Like I have yet to get it working with a Texas Instruments processor only because I'm not familiar enough with their code and their registers and everything, but it would just take more reading and more time. So this code is gonna be on the website on frozenelectronics.com along with this video. So when I post this video, I will put this code up there as well. Um, I might just copy and paste it or I might put it in a text or a PDF file, I'm not sure yet. But anyway, I just wanted to, yeah, show you guys basically 
how simple it is to create this. So let's actually go through the code here a little bit. Uh, maybe we can learn something. Here, I'll try and actually set up the tripod. Hopefully I can do this I'm right in front here. Hey, would you look at that? I think this is gonna work. All right, perfect. So now I'm hands-free and you're nice and stable. So, the first thing here, for those of you that don't know, whenever you use um, delay.h to include delays, you have to define the frequency of your CPU, and that's the way you do it. Define F CPU with an underscore in between, then you have to write it in hertz. Uh, and I always put the UL at the end, although you don't have to, you can actually just put um, the number itself. So in this case, it's 8 megahertz, so I have 8 and then 6 zeros. Then I'm including AVR IO, which is always there by default, and delay. Then I'm defining three of the codes that you might get back from the I squared C. Um, I can't remember what the name of the register is. I know it's TW, oh, the status register, that's right, SR. So if you, um, if a start condition was successfully sent, it'll be 0 by 0 8. If the slave, uh, if you send the address to the slave and it acknowledges, you'll get, it'll be a 0 by 1 8. And then if you send data to the slave and you get an acknowledge, it'll be 0 by 2 8. So that's just a way to check and make sure that the I squared C went through as intended. The next little thing here is a small little function just in case there's an error so if something goes wrong below this is called um, yeah it goes through this loop 10 times of turning it's actually 10 times it'll blink the LED on and off and then at the end it'll wait a second and a half and then it'll go back to wherever it was in the code and try again of course this is a very very basic error routine um, in most cases you would do something a lot more complex than this. You would have it, you know, reinitialize something or reset the chip or, you know, completely halt the processor or, you know, indicate in some other way to the user that something is wrong. This is the most basic of error routines. Then we get into the main routine itself. Um, so the data that we're sending to the DDS, I have it as an unsigned volatile integer. Um, you don't necessarily need to have the unsigned and the volatile. I prefer to do it that way when I'm prototyping and debugging. Volatile means that the uh, compiler won't uh, basically get rid of the actual uh, variable. Um, if the variable only has one or two values, sometimes it'll completely get rid of the variable and it'll just insert those values into the code. Putting volatile prevents it from doing that. The reason I do that is because then when I'm debugging, you can right click on this and you can choose um, add a watch, which means that you can actually watch what that uh, value is as it's running when you're debugging. Um, so just out of habit for important values like that, I almost always put it as a volatile. Same with the change. This is the amount of change for every uh, loop, how much it's going to change this value by. So I have it set to 1, and that seems to be pretty much the perfect value to get a nice clean triangle wave. And the next line here is the uh, bit rate. Now there's a um, there's a formula in the data sheet, and I'm actually going to show it to you guys here if I can get it up. And it's how you calculate that number, which is the two wire bit rate register. Depending on what you send, set this to, and depending on the frequency of your chip, remember before uh, I noted that it's running at 8 megahertz, um, and depending on your prescaler bits, you will get a different SCL frequency. Now in this case, you need to know what your SCL frequency needs to be. In my case, uh, I don't know if I have this up still. I was actually, oh no, I guess I don't have it up anymore. I was actually looking at the data sheet for this chip, the uh, MCP, or PCF8591, and I found that it's a 100 kilohertz SCL frequency it needs to be. So in order to get that 100 kilohertz, you take 8 megahertz, and then it's divided by, now for those of you that took math in high school, you'll remember bedmiss, or that's at least what we call it over in high school or in high school, in North American high school, which stands for brackets, exponents, division, multiplication, addition, subtraction. So that's the order you solve um, 
uh, algebra in basically. So what you have to remember when you're doing this is that you have to fill in, uh, you basically have to guess. The first thing to do is ignore the TWPS, pretend that that's just set to one, which means that this will always be a four. That's the easiest way to go. Um, because the higher you set that, the lower frequency you're going to get. And in most cases, you're going to want near the highest frequency that it can do. So I just pretend that that's a 4. So you have to remember, let's choose a random value. Like, let's say 10. You can go all the way up to 255. Um, but in this case, we'll try 10. So 2 times 10 is 20. Times 4 is 80. Plus 16 is 96. So in this case, let's see what that works out to. So, 8... 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, divided by 96 would give us a bit rate of uh, 83.333 kilohertz. A bit on the low side, um, that would work because most of these devices need, uh, it's usually defined in the maximum, so the maximum will be 100 kilohertz, but that's, I like to try and get closer. So, uh, let's try 9. Because remember, the lower we make this, that means we're dividing by less, so we're going to get a higher frequency. Uh, for those of you that aren't good at math, I apologize, that's just the way I think about things. Of course, when any fraction, if you have a lower number on the bottom, you're going to, this will solve to a bigger um, number. So let's try uh, 9. So 2 times 9 is 18 times 4, which I can't do off the top of my head. 18 times 4 is 72 plus 16 is 88. So 8 million, or yeah, sorry, 8 million, so 8 megahertz, divided by 88. So that gives us 90.909 kilohertz. Again, a bit closer, not quite. We're almost near the magic number. Now because I'm running at an even 8 megahertz, this makes it actually very easy. So let's try 8. 2 times 8 is 16, so 16 times 4 is 64 plus 16 is 80, and for those of you that are good at math, you can already see what's about to happen here. We get an even 100 kilohertz, or 100,000 hertz. So that's how, my and my other side here, that's why my TWBR, or 2-wire bitrate, is equal to 0 by 0 8. Now, because the default prescaler bits or what we saw as the exponent here, TWPS, that's actually another register. If you don't change that, it'll just stay to one by default. So that's why you don't see me assigning anything to TWPS there. So in this case, all you have to do is set, set the two wire bit rate to zero by zero eight, and that generates a perfect SCL of 100 kilohertz. Um, then I'm, sent, I'm setting my data direction for pin 7 as an output, that's for the LED, just so that when we call the error uh, function up above, the data direction is correct for that pin, so we can actually blink the LED. Moving on, so the first line here is going to be the same no matter what you're doing with 2-wire. As long as you have the bitrate set up correctly above, when you do this line here, that's the two-wire control register we're, we're changing here. So that's shifting one into two-wire interrupt. This is a key little piece here. Every time you do something with the control register, you have to write a one to two-wire interrupt because if that is a zero, which it, it sets it to a zero once it's done uh, once the hardware is done executing something related to the two-wire interface, it sets that to zero, and it won't do anything else until that's set to a one. So you can throw as many commands as you want at these registers, but if that two-wire interrupt bit is set to zero, it won't do anything. So we set that to a one, then we set one to TWSTA, which is the two-wire start. What that does is that will send a start condition. Now, as I said, you might want to read up on the I squared C protocol, but to start any interaction between the master and slave on an I squared C interface, you have to start with a start condition. So you send the start condition, and then the last one here is two wire enable. So setting that to a one will activate the two wire interface. This just prevents it from starting, this actually starts it. 
So setting that to a one will make it do whatever you've just told it to do. So in this case, we're telling it to generate a start condition. So setting that to a one will actually generate the start condition, assuming that two wire interrupt is set to a one as well. If this wasn't here, for example, and it was just like that, uh, it wouldn't matter what I did here, nothing would happen. So that has to be there. The next line, um, I won't go into the depths explaining the logic here because it's a little bit complex, but just this line, um, you can copy it verbatim out of the data sheet. All that does is it waits for that byte to finish. It's just waiting for the two wire interface to finish doing whatever you told it to do in the line before. Now you could technically omit this, uh, but there's a pretty good likelihood you might run into some problems depending on how fast things are happening, what's happening in between commands, if this is running as an interrupt or if it's in the main part of your code. It's usually just a good idea to stick that in there. So it'll force everything to wait until it's done. Now the next line is um, once this has been completed, once uh, any interaction has been completed by the two wire system, it'll set the status register to some particular value. Now, the reason it says two wire or TWSR and zero by F8, because the reason we're anding this value is because the prescaler bits, assuming that your prescaler bits are one, which means that we didn't make any changes up above here, we just left the two wire prescaler bits as is, we're masking those bits out so that we're left with just the status code. I know that sounds kind of complicated if you don't know much about logic or AVRs, then just ignore what I'm saying. This will work for you, assuming that A, you didn't set your two wire prescaler bits up here to anything, and B, you've defined start as something. So because up here we define start as zero by zero eight, after it's um, ended the prescaler bits with the status register, if that is not equal to start or zero by zero eight, then it'll call an error. So this will prevent it from going forward if for some reason the status is not a successful start. Because we just uh, sent a start condition, waited for it to be sent, now we're just checking to make sure that it was successfully sent. Now the hardware does that for us. You just have to look up in the data sheet what the codes are for a status. Again, you could omit this part, but again, it's just good coding to have it in there. Um, it's in there for a reason. They allow you to check the status register for a reason. Um, if your prescaler bits were different from one, you'd have to change this mask value here. Um, and I, I'm not going to go into how to do that because in most cases your prescaler bits are going to be one. So once again, you can actually copy this verbatim, assuming that you use the same name start. The reason that start is purple, I don't know if you can see that on the screen, is because it was defined up here. If this definition wasn't here, then that word down here, start, would mean nothing to the compiler and it would give us an error. But because we've defined it, that's why this works. So you can basically define, I mean, you can define anything up here. You could define, you know, literally anything. You can give a name to any value. It's not the same as, an, as a, a variable because a variable can be changed. This is a definition. Uh, there's actually a better word for it that's not coming to my top of my head right now, but uh, the reason you do this is because it's a constant. It's never going to change. It's just a number that you want it to remember, and it's something that you don't want to have to keep typing over and over. So you don't have to remember what these codes are. All you have to remember is that they're called start, SLAW, acknowledge, and data acknowledge. Anyway, moving on. I don't want this video to take forever. So now that we've, assuming that it's successfully sent it, now in most I squared C buses, after you send the start condition, you need to tell um, the devices, because often you can have more than one device on an I squared C bus. So now you need to send the address of the uh, device that you want to talk to. In our case, there's only one device on the bus, but that's irrelevant. You still need to send its address so that it knows that you're talking to it, because it doesn't know that there's no one else on the bus. 
um, so you have to address it. In this case, the reason I know the address is 0 by 9, 0, again, is from reading the data sheet of this part. Most I squared C, well, some anyway, some I squared C parts will actually have three pins on the actual device that can change what the address is. So let's say I had, you know, three or four of the same part all on the same bus. They're all going to be zero by nine, zero by default. But if you pull one of those pins high, it'll become zero by nine, one. If you pull two of them high, it'll be zero by nine, two. Um, and it's basically just a binary three digit number. So you can get all the way up to zero by nine, seven. Um, if you had all three of them pulled high. Anyway, that's just a little aside, but so now we're sending the address, we're doing the same thing. Um, we're going to the control register, because see, we've told it what to do. We want to, we've loaded 0 by 90 into the data register. But now we need to tell it to do it. So we go back to the control register, just like we did here. The reason we didn't have a data register here is because what we wanted it to do is actually a built-in part of the control register, which means that the start and stop codes are hardwired into the AVR. So we didn't need to load anything into the data because it already knows what to do when we tell it one shifted left into TW start. So down here, we're sending the address, then we're telling it, again, as I said before, you have to write a one to twint, because when it completed the last transaction, it'll have set that to a zero. So it won't do anything else until we set that to a one. And then again, one to two wire enable. So anytime you send data bytes, once you've done your start, pretty much every data interaction is gonna look like this. Um, which means that we set, we, have the piece of data we want to send, we write one to the interrupt and one to the enable, we wait for it to send, which is that same while loop that we had above. That's the same one you're going to have every time. That just waits for it to finish sending. Then if um, the status register does not equal um, you know, the slave address acknowledge, then we call the error. And again, the hardware knows that the first byte is going to be the start, the second byte is going to be the address, and then everything else following that is going to be data. So that's why the start, address, and data acknowledge are three different codes. Oops. Because it knows um, that those are going to happen in that order. And then once you have the start and the address sent, you can have literally as many data um, acknowledges as you want. So, now we've sent the start condition, we've sent the address, so the chip knows wh who we're talking to. Now we need to send the data that's going to create our little triangle wave. So we start at zero, as we have defined up here, and the amount of change each loop is one. So it's going to count from zero all the way up to FF. For those of you that don't know hex, that's 255 which is what this first little section here does. So it's loading in that data DDS, which in this case is still, uh, we started out as a zero. It loads that in and it does all the two wire stuff I just showed you. It sends that value of zero. Now, because of the way I have things set up with the address, uh, you'll have to read the data sheet for your device, but, um, that's the write address. So when I'm writing to this chip, it knows that I want it to do a digital to analog conversion. So we load in the data, we send it, and the second it sends, it's gonna start producing whatever value we sent on the analog output pin. So um, these delays are commented out just because I was playing around with delays. So the second that this is complete, we're gonna start getting whatever value we sent on the analog output pin, which is kind of cool. That's how cool this DAC is. That's all you have to do is send the start condition, send the address, and then you can just start throwing data at it and it'll just start making that into an analog value based on whatever data you send it. So in this case, this loop just happens over and over and over again. It says, is data DDS all the way at the top already? If so, then the amount of change we want is now minus one. If we get all the way back down to the bottom, if data DDS is equal to zero, then the amount of change we want is one, positive one. 
So once it's checked both of these things, assuming that either of these or neither of these is called, then it's gonna do data DDS, and then this is a little shortcut you can do, ah, I keep doing that by accident. Plus equals just means I wanna change, I want to change this by this amount. So I could do data DDS equals data DDS plus change. This is just a shorter way of writing that. For those of you, if I was saying that too fast, I could write it like this. Data DDS equals data DDS plus change. But that's a much longer way. This is just a little shortcut. So data DDS plus equals change. You can also do minus equals. Um, I think you can also do uh, star equals for uh, multiply and slash equals for divide. And that's it. So it changes the data DDS. In our case, because it's um, not zero, or in this case it is zero, but it doesn't matter because it's just gonna change it to one, then the data is gonna go to one. So it's gonna send a one. Then it's gonna go through again. It's gonna send a two, three, four, five, six. And it's just screaming along, counting all the way up to 255. It gets to 255 and then it reverses direction and starts sending it starts subtracting one every time. So when you add minus one to a value, you're just decreasing it by one. So then it counts all the way back down to zero. Now, if this was just a random program, it would just be counting up and down over and over and over again. But because this isn't just a random program and it's actually sending that data to a DAC, we get our nice triangle wave. Anyway, this is getting to be a very long video. I just wanted to explain that. Um, I hope you guys understand that. I'm assuming that you have some experience with AVRs and with programming in the C language. Otherwise, this uh, whole, whoop, sorry. Otherwise, this whole video would be probably hard for you to follow. But I just wanted to show you my basic DDS that I wrote in the last hour. It's taken me half an hour, 32 minutes to explain it. And this is without editing. I did this all in one take. Um, again, the code is going to be on the website, so if you're watching this on YouTube, pop on over to frozenelectronics.com. Again, the code is in the public domain, so feel free to just copy and paste this code. If you happen to have one of these chips, or if you have something similar, or if you just want to use the two-wire codes that I've written for the uh, Atmega324A, this will be almost identical to the Atmega32. The only differences might be in the name of the registers. All the other code will be the same, but uh, TWDR, TWCR, actually I think in the Atmega32, I think all of these would actually be identical. So this code can probably just be copy and pasted to the Atmega32, probably the Atmega16, the Atmega644. Um, I'm pretty sure it only has one two-wire interface as well. It's when you get into chips that have more than one, it'll add a zero onto the end or a one, depending on which of the two ports you're using. So I hope that this explanation hasn't been too complicated. If I talk too fast, or if uh, concepts are going over your head and you're not understanding something, please ask in the comments, either on YouTube or over on the website. You can comment on the actual blog post that has this video in it. Feel free to ask me questions. I am happy to answer them. If you didn't understand something or if you want clarification, just ask. I would be more than happy to help. You can also email me, uh, Aurelius at frozenelectronics.com. That's spelled A-U-R-E-L-I-U-S at frozenelectronics.com. You can, as I said, you can post on the blog, you can comment. Um, there's tons of ways to get in touch with me. I'm also known as Mr. Aurelius R over on the EEV blog forums. So you can go over there and send me a message. Um, also, um, what was the other thing I was going to say? Oh, it just popped out of my head. So keep checking back. Um, if you want to send me things, uh, I don't know how big my audience is yet, but it would be nice to uh, get postcards or whatever from you guys just to know that there are viewers out there. Um, you can send stuff to me. Um, I'll put the address in the description. My address is also on the about page over on the blog. Um, well here actually, I'll just cover my name up, my real name, although I'm sure most of you already know my, what my real name is, but there's, whoops, there's my address, 25-1585 Heron Road, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, and my postal code is K1V9V1. 
So you can put uh, frozen electronics, you can put, uh, well, whatever, my name's Alexander here. You can see my full address. So, Alexander Rousel, 25-1585 Heron Road, Ottawa, Ontario, K1V9V1. I'm not asking anyone to send me anything, just in case people are curious. I've noticed that most bloggers do that, just in case people want to send them something. Um, I would be pleasantly surprised if you do, but don't feel obligated. Also, please like and subscribe, that helps me a lot. Likes, subscribes, comments, those are all really good. They'll help me get popularity on YouTube. If you're feeling like you know someone who could benefit from this information, feel free to share the link to them. There's many ways to share stuff on YouTube. Anyway, I've rambled on long enough. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks for watching Frozen Electronics, and we'll see you again soon. Bye.